Welcome to Life on Life's Terms, um, episode 15. We have Rick Jamerson. Jamerson. Jamerson, who's who's in, in the studio today. And uh, I've been told by countless people that this is a very fascinating story. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> no pressure, no pressure. <laughs> so um, you're new to the program. Uh, usually, what yes. we, usually what we try to do is we try to get... Uh, People just to talk about themselves a little bit, um, where they started out in life kind of thing, and then um, the listeners kind of get get an idea of who you are, and then we, we go from there. Um, so what, what did childhood look like for Rick? Uh, actually, I'm going to start back before that, Okay. Uh, just because of the historical nature of, of our family. Uh, my father, Leon Jamerson, was born to a pioneering family that had moved up into the Saskatchewan area in the early 1900s. Uh, we were some of the black settlers that came up from the United States. Uh, okay. And we settled in and around Alberta. There was actually five uh, major communities. Okay. And um, we lived in one in Saskatchewan. Um, I was born in Prince Rupert, BC. My dad traveled around quite a bit after his father passed away and was working pretty well all across Canada, but mostly on the West Coast, on the fishing boats and oh, stuff yeah. like that. So I ended up being born in Prince Rupert. Um, That's a tough town. Well, I was only there till I was six. Okay. Uh, I started school, and shortly after that, we moved to the interior of BC to Clearwater. There, um, That's where I pretty well spent my childhood and into my teens, my early teens, um, and that, I guess that's where my life starts. Uh, you, I uh, grew up there. My dad, of course, um, not being a well-educated man, he only had a grade three education, but was very intelligent, was able to build anything, fix yeah. anything. Um, he had me working alongside him. And uh, as a teenager, that only lasts so long, especially when you're not getting paid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so... Um, so when you start to speak up about it, or I think you're old enough to speak up about it, um, you get put in your place, and then sooner or later you do get to a point where, okay, well, this is enough. Mm-hmm. And I decided to leave home at 16. Um, wasn't the smartest move I ever made, but I th- uh, at that time I thought it was. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I thought I'd do quite a bit, and even though my dad used to tell me, you don't know nothing. But yeah, you get out there and you realize that he was right, but there is no way you're going back. Um, for two years in the Clearwater area there, I couch surfed from friend's place, you know, couch to couch sort of thing. And then finally made a decision to move to Alberta where an uncle of mine had said, yeah, come out, get yourself a job and, um, you can make your way from here. And so I thought, okay, this is the opportunity I was looking for because in Clearwater, by that time, my name was Mud. Uh, so how did that happen? Well, in small town BC, there wasn't much to do. So you end up starting partying, doing drugs, drinking, doing things you shouldn't against the law. And the police even told me, when you turn 18, we're coming for you. And so <laughs> <laughs> so I, I made that exit. So you're um, already on the radar. <laughs> I was for a lot of years, yeah. Um, I made that exit just after my 18th birthday. I had turned 18 July 14th, and by July 18th, I was on the road to Alberta. Uh, with an aunt of mine, and yeah, I settled here. I had I have lots of family here. Um, the the Jamerson family married quite a few into quite a few of the the other black families, so we're we're fairly large. Yeah, and and they they also are a large family, like the Mazes and the Lafayettes and uh, oh, the yeah. Fords. Yeah. right. So you you probably know some of the names, especially yeah, from boxing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and Al- Alberta's had um, you know held a lot of us here, but there were some that actually went back to the States and stuff like that. We we're actually Excellent. able to connect with. So, uh, how did the boxing career start? <laughs> well, you know that when you're doing one thing in one place, when you end up somewhere else, you're normally doing the same thing, even though you're trying to change. Yeah. Um, and that's what happened. I moved here and I, um, I was trying to sell drugs, yeah. um, it, before I got a job actually. And um, I met this guy, it was about, he was about 6'4", over 200 pounds, with a set of Dayton's on. 
And he introduced those to my head after he ripped me off. <laughs> but before that, um, when he said he wasn't going to pay me, I'm like, well, he said, all I could do is my best. So I jumped up in the air, and I'm only 5'10". I jumped up the air, gave him a couple shots in the head, and that didn't phase him at all. And that's where he grabbed me by my afro and started to, to boot me in the head as I was trying to pull away from him. Um, that was a turning point for me at one. Uh, I went home, got a baseball bat, went back looking for him, but I uh, didn't find him. Thank God you didn't. Uh, yeah, because I probably would have been dead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he took it away from me. He used it on me. Uh, but at that point, I realized that I had to, you know, learn something to, to protect myself. Um, and that's where I ended up at the Southside Legion Boxing Club. Yeah. The coach there... So, so you've always been at Southside? Yes, yes. Oh, loyalty. Wow. And, and you find that in boxing for the most part. Uh, once you, you start to get up there, you, yeah, the loyalty is there. You're very loyal to the club. Um, so, yeah, it's while well, now. Uh, I'm 38 years in, in boxing, and uh, we actually reestablished the original uh, club's name, Southside Legion Boxing Club, we operate on the south side. It's been it's been good. Excellent. So, yeah. so you started how long ago there? Uh, I started when I was 18 as soon as I got here. Okay. That wasn't much after I got here. Um, and been, yeah. The club, when I went to the club, the old deal, there was two of the original founding members, Teddy James and um, uh, Jim Parsons. And they, um, they took me in. Uh, Jim, or Teddy said, Came came over, that's okay. Sorry, came over, started showing me, showing me some stuff, and and he said, you know what, you come back, right? And so I came back, and so what was the attraction into boxing? Well, I had I had grown up watching Muhammad Ali, all the major fights on when television came out, um, and then Sugar Ray Leonard, Hagler, Hearns, yeah. uh, all the all the old greats. Um, but Sugar Ray Leonard was the one that I, I emulated myself after, for sure. So um, you, you tried to adopt his style? A, a lot of I did actually adopt his style as well as I learned a lot about the, uh, the Cuban, the way the Cubans yeah, yeah. Uh, boxed. I uh, implemented a lot of what they did in the early stages uh, where most guys just want to stand there and pound on each other. I didn't like to get hit, so I learned to move, <laughs> yeah. block, slip, yeah. hit you and not get hit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think that's the whole the whole premise of, of the of the game when you're in there, right, is to stay within the edge of that range, that be able true. to pop in and out and then come back and, and, and be able to uh, safeguard your face as much as you possibly can. That right? is very true. <laughs> so in boxing, uh, what was what was the highlight in, in the fighting part of it for you? Uh, well, first off, going back, uh, when I finally got serious about it, I, I had to make a decision. Um, you know, the coaches really thought I had, had uh, potential, and I really enjoyed it, and, but I was still partying in that, and so I had to make a decision whether I was going to continue to party or try to accomplish something in it, and I decided to accomplish some, try to accomplish something. Uh, gave up the drugs and alcohol and uh, started to train. Uh, my first fight uh, is the most memorable one. You never forget it. Yeah. I was in there with a guy that um, that had boxed before. And um, unbeknownst to me, <laughs> I got in there and thinking that, you know, I was all slick and all that. And it was just like everything just went out the window as soon as he hit me. And it was like two girls trying to fight. <laughs> 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 right? and, and I mean, honestly, I, I actually ended up winning the fight. And, but coach comes over, looks at me and shakes his head. I said, what? I'm all proud. I'll pumped up. He says, back to the drawing board. <laughs> 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 so I, yeah, I didn't get my head, didn't get too swelled. But uh, the only reason I won is the other guy ran out of gas before me because he was outside smoking before the fight. And, but at that point, I realized that um, I never wanted to be in a situation where I was not in shape in the ring. Yeah, yeah. Because having the having no ability whatsoever to protect or defend yourself that 
that it's actually, scary, scary as hell yeah. right oh for sure so we were uh i was just talking to somebody before like i've taken a couple of uh pretty serious hits in the head in my, in my time mm-hmm. and uh so i was watching this show a little while ago and they were talking about um concussions right okay and pro fighters what a lot of them are experiencing right now is they can't see the game anymore so mm-hmm. they're literally firing they're firing fists off of not even combos or trying to pick mm-hmm. they're literally just almost fighting on survival right from round one all the way to round 12 hmm. because the brain is no longer able to see what the other person is you know that they're throwing right but you don't see the combination that they're trying half the chess game is gone now right, right. have you have you uh, experienced any of that with seeing anybody or uh, well my myself i haven't experienced that but i i do know now looking back that there was a few times that i had had concussions but um, not not knowing at that time not understanding the, yeah. that portion of it um nowadays you can recognize yeah uh when it when a per, when a, a boxer's taken too many shots Especially if he takes um if he takes a shot and all of a sudden he kind of stops and blinks and it's like for a split second he just stands there and then he gets back into action, that's at a a point where I know that okay you've taken too many shots. I used to call it the stutter start. It, very good, yeah. Exactly. You know what I mean? It was exactly. like they're stuttering and then they were then they would pop yeah. in, right? Yeah, exactly. And that's I tell our boxers if you see that, jump on them, throw them three or throw three or four more punches because they'll land. And you just get the extra couple of points. Yeah. Right. So. Yeah. So um, I'm sure that there's some of the listeners out there, uh, I have heard this where the younger the kids are in a, in a sport of this nature, the, they're less likely to hurt each other. And the reason why they're less li- likely to hurt each other is because they don't have, like, let's say 10 or below, the age of 10 or below. They're less likely to hurt themselves because the muscle power just isn't there. So... Mm-hmm the the knockout power is likely not to happen and therefore you can actually teach technique because you know the likelihood of them hurting each other is not is not mm-hmm. there right mm-hmm. would you agree with that uh to a point for sure um when it comes to power you can generate that two ways by fear uh sheer force uh-huh. or by technique and once once a, a small doesn't matter the size of the kid gets that technique down, he he can actually hit pretty hard. Yeah, once he starts throwing their hips yeah. and everything, yeah, yeah the, the going, rotation for sure, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So I mean, in some ways, yes, in the beginning stages, um, yes. But once they start to get a little bit more skilled, then you you still do have to watch. But amateur boxing is very very uh, safe in that aspect for these kids. Uh, we have. A program in amateur boxing right now called Fun Box. Okay, it's where both boxers they get in. It's like sparring, but they both get uh, their hands raised. There's no loser. Oh, okay, okay. Um, but the referee's in there, just like it. It's a, a bout, and if one one child gets hit too many times or too hard, then it would get stopped. Okay. They they try to discuss between the coaches. Okay, uh, if if one is overpowering, okay, go into tell. His athlete, okay, go into defensive mode, let this guy throw a few shots, get used to that sort of thing. So that you're working together rather than trying to. Yeah, I used to remember that other. as a kid. You'd have one kid in your class who could just beat the living shit out of you, right? Yes. And he became he became the one kid where the coach would uh, give a lot of his time to mm. and left the rest of us trying to catch up. Right, right. right. And then the other thing that I, this I remember. So I wasn't, I wasn't a, a rich kid growing up at okay. all so so poor poor kids box rich kids don't that's box that's true. that's that's the truth yeah. and uh the rich kids play hockey though right mm-hmm. so when i was a kid these hockey jocks used to kick the living shit out of us right and so what we realized is when we were uh, training is that we would be tired after training okay right so when they would come off the ice we would go down to the rink and kick the fuck out of them with, 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 right their, own, with their own sticks. <laughs> you know, take their sticks away from them, beat the shit out of them while, right while, while the parent, the dad's come pulling up the truck, you yeah, know, or warming yeah, it up yeah. or whatever. And the kids are just burnt right out, right? And then the next day they come to school and they're still all fucked up from the training. And then they just got their asses kicked. 
It was pretty good, right? Uh, that right, was, on. Yeah. <laughs> right on. That's a good. That's a definitely a good way. And I, yeah. I also found that within the gym, what ended up happening is you're right that that, uh, like for me, I could only ever account it to being a gang mentality. But it's mm. not really a gang mentality. It's more of a, like you were saying a loyalty yes. mentality, yeah. right? And I never ever had like I. I looked for that many times in my life outside of the gym right. and it landed me into motorbike enthusiast groups, mm. you know, and da, 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 all these things. And, uh, what I had come to realize looking back at it, that was one of the best times of my life, that camaraderie right, right, when I was yeah. young in the gym doing what I was doing. Um, and you didn't, I didn't have to be the best at it, right. you know, um, later on in life, I did go into mixed martial arts and mm -hmm. started fighting in that capacity. Mm -hmm. But I found we had, um, a guy in here named big Jeff on, and one of the jo uh, shows that we had. And, um, he was saying he's finally now working out for himself. Mm. He's not working out. For, so he, this guy was a pro footballer and he was also a pro wrestler at one time in his life. And it went to active addiction and now he's recovered. Right. But anyways, Aside from that, he was saying, and it didn't really dawn on me until he had said that I'm working out for me now. I'm not mm. working out for the gym or the guys. And I started realizing that even as much as we were working out, like I had some serious self-confidence issues as a kid. Right. And I understand like the, the child program that you're talking about, that's really what you're trying to do is build that self-confidence yes, so that yes. it's, it's spread evenly for everybody. But what I had come to realize is even when I was working out as a kid and get in, in half decent shape, I was still lacking that self-confidence because mm -hmm. I wasn't working out for me. I was working out for the for the gym yeah, and the club. how fucking dare you get knocked out? Do you know what gym you're oh, in? Yeah. See, like, that, <laughs> we're a little different at our gym there <laughs> in that aspect. Um, the way that the way that we do it is, yes, these kids come along and one always tops the other. But the one that's down below, then we start to work with him to bring him above the guy yeah. that just got top. So we just kind of keep building him, each other, each of them on over each other. So they get better together. Okay. Right. Um, that way, the, you're, you're not running into that. That's okay. I, I can't, um, be, because I understand that you, in boxing, yes, there's always the top guy. But we try to leave that outside of the gym. Yeah. yeah. Right. The other clubs, if we're the top guy in that category in Alberta, that's where we want to be. Yeah. Within the club, like the last five, four years, we've had three guys in the same weight category. Wow. At the national level. That's excellent. They've had to t fight each other. And that's... That's tough. That's a nightmare for us. Yeah. But um, in order to, to move on, they do. And then when they're done the fight, they get together and, hey, man, good fight, so on and so forth. Right? And the best man at that time moves on. That's great because that really shows the amount of camaraderie that's needed in order to build as a team yes. going up. Yeah. I remember in mixed martial arts, they had the uh, IFL, Independent Fight League, mm -hmm. and it yes. was set in the same way. It was all team and, you know, uh, it was about the team making the points as a po and you would make your points by winning your fight. Right. And then the team would won win the tournament based on points, based yeah. on points. Right. So it, it kind of reminded me, as soon as you were saying that, it reminded me of that kind of scheme of things. Right, and right. That, that makes a hell of a lot more sense because before it was literally you were by yourself in the gym. Yes, you were yeah. by yourself in the, in the ring and you were together cutting weight. Right. But that was the only time <laughs> that you guys were together That's, was yeah. cutting weight, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so just back to your boxing career, how deep did you go in? Um, well... I got to the national level. Um, I went to nationals a couple times. I made the mistake in my early 20s of uh, quitting for five years. And that was the biggest mistake ever made. Uh, now I preach that to the rest of these athletes. But um, I, I got to the point where I was the best in Alberta. Um, and they had to bring in boxers for me to, to fight at tournaments and stuff like that because everybody else. Won. So what, what weight class were you fighting I, At that time, I was a welterweight, 147. Okay. Um, and uh, that I got knocked out just prior to the Nationals at the Golden Gloves by uh, Joe Pendry out of Saskatchewan. Joe, if you're out there, no. <laughs> Whatever you imagine, no, I'm just joking about it. <laughs> um, and I was... Definitely out of sorts. A little pissed off at myself because I had won the fight, 
And for some reason, the end of the third round, I said, I got to get points, I got to get points. And I started after him, and he just kept backing up, lined me up, straight right hand. I hit, he hit me, I hit the canvas, I was, it was black, I bounced off the canvas, I woke up, I hit the canvas again, I look over, I see my coach coming through the ropes in slow motion, and I'm like, I gotta finish the fight, I gotta finish the fight, he says, no, it's over. <laughs> was that the first time you ever knocked that out? That was the first and last time I was ever knocked out. Yeah. That's that's a real motherfucker. Yeah. Right? The oh, first, it's, it, that's, that's such a a slice of humble pie oh, that nobody man, yeah. nobody knows and like yes, and, and you, you feel <laughs> and and you yeah literally right yeah and uh you f- you feel that in the shower yeah you know you try to keep your chin up as much as as you can um i've been knocked out <laughs> i've been knocked out pretty pretty serious in sparring but never mm. never in a fight so sparring oh. i've been knocked out but not not like not in there in the fight, you know yeah. and i've been pretty lucky i've yeah. i've so i used to mix martial arts i would fight at uh, 205 i'm oh. only i'm only 510 yeah, so yeah. i would always be fighting giants that were like six foot six foot two six foot four and they come in and they give me a, a knee right to the fucking head as i was coming <laughs> in to shoot to because i only had one game plan pick him up drop him on his head and then try to pound the shit out of him right right, right yeah and uh so that's what I would do. But every time I come in and shoot, he just they just fucking knee me in the head. They would they would clinch me and then poof right in the right in the center of my face, right. And uh, I'd I'd always feel I, I would I tell my coach I'd have to feel the stars before I knew I was gonna pick them and, and drop them, right. <laughs> And that's what it always was. Every fucking time, it was always wow. that way. And then finally, um, my coach said, "Why don't you drop to 180, 185? So I dropped down to 185 and said, let's fight at 175. So when I started fighting at 175, I was just fucking ragdolling these guys uh, because my, my, my muscle was coming from carrying around 205, 220, 230, right, 240. Yes, yes. And I, fuck, nobody could stop me then, <laughs> right? I was yeah, like, uh, like, I felt really good about it. And then uh, a Thai guy fucking booted. He caught his shin into my chin mm. in, in sparring. That was it, son. I oh. I tasted the canvas then, and then I was doing cocaine in that gym. Mm. And these guys, these guys come from Brazil that I was training with. Yeah, yeah. Get the fuck out of mm. here, man! You know they they were not about that at all. Mm. And I I jumped into the other side of life. But my my fighting started from boxing, mm. and then trying to break from boxing into Muay Thai and kickboxing was really, really difficult for me. I had a, I had a very difficult time because of the, the stance. It's not square anymore. Right, right. You know, every, everything ends up changing. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, your hips now are moving two different ways. They're moving to throw hands, and they're also moving to, uh, oh. to throw kicks, right? Right, right. And they, trying to get that high kick up there, fucking 205, and trying to get my leg up to somebody's <laughs> head, man, was yeah. pretty difficult, yeah. right? Um, but back to the boxing. Uh, so the things that you're seeing coming up for developing right now, what would you say is different today than it was before? Um, well, not, not much of change, but there, there has been some changes for sure. Um, I, like I had mentioned off air there, I, I just took a recent trip to Puerto Rico. We took one of our boxers to fight the national champ of Puerto Rico on, um, uh, live tv there for their people and and we took a team of 16 from canada and we only got three wins yeah they were definitely ready what do you typically typically get here in canada you know that was my first trip with in in this sort of uh environment so i'm not sure but this wasn't even their national team but we stayed at their olympic village you right uh we trained at their their center mm-hmm and yeah they they were ready they their strength their conditioning their intensity was just through the roof compared to compared to the majority of our our team mm-hmm. um the ones that i saw i didn't get to see, actually see all the fight because we fought and then we were on the plane coming back that night um uh, that quick eh? yeah it, it was yeah we we got a bad bad run there <laughs> what, what was what was the time change like two three hours uh three hours yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what was it like on the ground for like electricity people are still saying that at that time they had electricity there but you could really still see a lot of the damage from the the hurricane uh, that had went through there 
um, there would be houses with no roof, no windows, and then wow. one next door with with everything was okay. Um, so yeah, you you could see that, but like I say, there, there was a lot of trees and stuff like that toppled over at the center there. But sure. for the most part, it was it was good. They took really good care of us, treated us well, uh, made some really good friends. Uh, we hope to have bring some of them over here and that'd be pretty cool. Yeah, right? yeah. So what were the big differences between that Puerto Rico team and, and the guys that you were bringing in? Um, the, the biggest thing there, there, the skill level was a lot higher. Mm-hmm. Um, their intensity was, was just, like I say, through the roof. Uh, yeah, they, they really had no problem with it, with, with what we brought as a team. Um, it, it just it just seemed well i guess let's put it put it this way in canada here we mm-hmm. box for fun yeah but they box for life to live yeah 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 right so yeah. there is a difference there they actually train and that's their way out um mm-hmm. and you could really see it i think if i can if i can just say this too like uh, in montreal it's it, in, in in my opinion it's the same way when you go down to places like La Salle, Jacques Cartier, mm. you know, um, you go into the slums, so mm. to say, or even I remember shit in Toronto, Jane and Finch region park area. Mm-hmm. It's, it's changed a lot now, but that was hell. Mm. And you, if you wanted to touch good boxers, those guys didn't give a fuck what you were. If, and being white, they wanted you even more, <laughs> right? Yes, like, like, yes. you know what I mean? Yeah. The heat was on. Yes. And, um, and me being French, if I was fighting an English guy, the heat was on, mm, right? Yes, yes. And it was the same thing. Like we would have, um, I'm not going to, so we'd have people like Trudeau who come from the hill right, to yes, come down yeah. and box in the slum, slumming it to show that, show the poor people that they could do what they could. And we would just fuck them up. Right. <laughs> but then the coach would come up to you afterwards and say, no, no, you can't do that. Their, their parents are the ones who are keeping the club open. Right, right. You got to stop that. Like you can't show them <laughs> what you can do because that's what's happening here. Hmm. And uh, I agree with you, though. In Canada, there are the ideology behind it is more about having fun, getting in shape. And so people don't commit all the way. But when you go into the ghettos throughout, throughout Canada, that's where I think you find that one gem in the rough. Yes. Yes. You know, like uh, yes. uh, Lemieux when he came out, but he he actually comes from a fairly rich family as well mm-hmm. in Montreal. So he like George Saint Pierre does not come from a rich family. He comes from a very blue collared family. I know his family. Like right, I know right. I, I know I know um, his family f- fairly well, and uh, he doesn't come from anything spectacular. But mm-hmm. like you look at Lemieux, who is a boxer, yes. and he boxes in. I think he has boxed in Pierre's Saint Pierre's gym, and he he comes from a fairly wealthy family. But then you saw when he went up against Billy Joe Saunders. Billy Joe Saunders just fucking took him apart. Like it, it was bad. And you right. look at where Billy Joe Saunders is from. He's a pikey in England. Mm-hmm. Like he's yeah. he lived in a trailer his entire life, right? So I think poverty is a huge motivator for bo- boxers to for, for, sure. for a, a large portion. For sure, it, that's actually if I just add to that a little bit, that's one thing we're starting to see in, in amateur boxing in Canada at that cable level. Mm-hmm. Um, it's starting to become a rich kid sport because there's no support for the um the athletes coming up until you get to such and such a level in order to get to that such and such a level i your parents have to have money so off, off air i have an idea well i've been talking to some place in the city that we live in and i have a, i have an idea that um might be able to help kids coming out of the okay. ghetto in the area that we're in right, right? right okay. but we'll talk about that off yeah, air for sure, for but sure. I, I definitely see that too like yeah. i see these rich people uh, or I, I hate to say it that way but i see people <laughs> who have a little bit more privilege yes. than others yes. who are coming into the world of fighting and they can dominate only only because they have the money but they really don't have the will and when they when they get the win they're living in the win. Right, right. People who come from nothing and nowhere, we know that winning just means the other fucking shoe is going to fall and it's going <laughs> to fall way quicker than the win happened. <laughs> you know, like yeah, that's yeah. that ghetto mentality, yeah. right? And that's that's what's really, really strange when I see these kids who, 
you know, their dads are dropping them off in a fucking Mercedes, you yes, know, that yeah. it's not the way it was when I was growing no, up, you know, no. my, my boxing shoes weren't even boxing shoes. They were fucking socks. <laughs> and, and, and I only got the ham downs from the kid who just quit. Yeah. Yeah. You I know, he, he, he went off to, to, you know, uh, young corrections yeah. from where I was from. And so mm. when that happened, then I got his, his gear yeah. and I still had to pay $2 a week to fucking use it. It was a <laughs> rental fee, right? <laughs> Shit. I didn't even own it. I mean, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. what it was. Yeah. Right. And they used to tell us, uh, go find the stinkiest gloves. Cause that's what the kids wear. You know, like, because the adults would get the better stuff. Right, yeah. And the gym, the gym was mixed with, men, like, adults and kids at the same time. Because they just didn't have the trainers or the coaches to to handle just the kids and then just the right, adults. Yeah. So they would just mix us all in, in together, right? Mm-hmm. It's fucking scary, man. You're walking in and there's a 20, 24, 25-year-old kid or some 17-year-old kid just kicking the shit out of a heavy <laughs> bag, right? You're like, what the fuck? <laughs> so, uh, obviously, you're coaching now. Yes. yes. But prior to coaching, um, you, you had your first fight, and then you were uh, basically champ of Alberta. Yeah, for, for, for a few years there. Um, then I... I did actually end up after the five years hiatus. I came back, realized that well, I, during the five years, I realized I wasn't finished with the sport, and I had a, a real, uh, real change of mindset in life in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, as a person, personal changes really took took their turn there for me in a positive way. Um, and so I said, you know what? No, I need to finish this. I started it. I knew it wasn't finished. I need to finish it so that when I'm done, I can live with what I've accomplished. And um, so that's when I, I took it back up about five years later. I was able to get uh, back to the provincial champion level, held that for a number of years again, and then got to the nationals a couple times. Wasn't able to make it to the gold medal. I did get a bronze. Um, that's still. my first, my first trip there. Uh, yeah, it was, um, for me, it was, it was definitely an accomplishment because that had been the highest I, I had got. I traveled a few times to the States and fought kind of under Canada's ba- banner or Alberta's banner, but not as a Canadian team member, but oh, okay. for sure. Um, it was, it was great. Won a few fights down there, lost a few fights down there sort of thing. Yeah. That's a tough but game down there. Yeah. Oh yes. Yes it is. You know, it's cause it's that melting pot literally. Yes. You know, yes. you have, you have the Mexicans coming up to go, you got the Cubans in there. You got Puerto Ricans in there. You've got, and just got the, the Americans, white Irish kids. Just the Americans. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, the black Americans were killer. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. yeah, we, I mean, but the biggest thing that was, I had an opportunity to travel. Because mm-hmm. at that time hadn't really been outside of Canada, and so I got to go down to the states quite a, you know three or four times for boxing, and it was just, it was it was great. I just loved it because they made at that time the coaches that took us made it a little bit more than just go down box and then come back. They mm-hmm. took us out, showed us some things, stuff like that. So now, when I take the team and we go somewhere, I try to ins- do a little bit of that too, show them around a bit. And, that's right. that's excellent. Yeah. I mean, because it's memories that that stick. Like you, you're there with a team of five or six kids, yeah, and they're together. Like that's how you build memories from the sport. Right? Yeah, like myself. Uh, it's funny. One of our coaches, he's on the island right now. Um, he was coaching with us, but like I BC fought him. Island? Yeah, BC Island. Oh, Victoria Vancouver. Island, yeah, Vancouver. Yeah, Vancouver. Yeah, yeah. And I fought him up here way back in the '80s. And he came back up here looking for me for a rematch. No. <laughs> Keith, if you're listening, no reach, Matt. rematch, man. No. Yeah, he came up, but he looked me up because he, from that fight, um, he, he wanted to get together with me here. And he was here for a while. He started coaching at the club. And it, is, it was a great, a great thing. He really helped us get the club along. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So, I mean, the life, it is a lifestyle. And like I say, the, the, the kids you meet or the people that you meet tend to, you get, you, they're with you for a long time mm-hmm. down the road. So what, what, what were you doing in that five years, hi, uh, five year hiatus? Um, well, I had already had one child, uh, and a serious, uh, 
serious mate at the time, and unfortunately it didn't work out, and we ended up having two children, so the second one was during that time. Um, but yeah, our lives, when I started to change as a person, she wasn't looking to go the same direction, so we we ended it there. I hear you. We just did an episode of Shitty Relationships, <laughs> and uh, and uh, and uh, we we have come to to realize that sometimes you're just unmarriageable mm. in moments of your life, right? Yeah, yes. And uh, you know, we attract that law of attraction. We attract what we what we were, and then when we change, no longer does that law of attraction work anymore, right? Very true. Very true. And. Yes. Uh, this is why I always tell young, like I mentor a lot of young, younger men. And I say to them, I say, don't get married until you're past 30. Cause <laughs> everything's going to fucking change when you turn 30. Believe me, <laughs> you know, more, uh, your, your, your life expectancy and death is going to become very apparent when you turn right, 30. Right. <laughs> like, yes. like if I thought about going into MMA when I was 23 and going into MMA today at my age, not a fucking chance. Exactly. Right? exactly. I mean, I'm not putting up my hands unless I have headgear on, <laughs> 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 a mouth guard, yes, yeah. and fucking 16 ounce gloves. Okay, yeah. there, there's no way yeah. that we're, we're we're doing anything outside of those the, that realm, I right? No, that's I, I hear you there. Like I I don't spar. I don't do anything anymore. I can barely even. Well, I shouldn't say I'm not crippled, but I, I do have a hard time doing things now. So yeah, I'm trying to work myself back into some shape where I am, I'm usable at the gym again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what does coaching look like for you? How much fun are you having with it? Um, you know what? I've enjoyed coaching from day one, especially when you, you, you take a young guy and you bring him along year after year, even month after month, and you see the progress. Mm-hmm. Um, that's, that's fulfilling for me because like for what, what boxing did for me, um, it, it saved me. It turned me around because I was heading in the wrong direction. Um, I would have been in dead or, dead or in jail. There's no doubt about it in my mind. Okay. Uh, boxing helped to turn me around from that. And um, now just working with these young kids or even adults, a lot of adults, um, my, my, my motto is I'm not going to blow you any smoke. Mm-hmm. I'm going to tell you exactly how it is in boxing and it, or if it has something to do with life. Yeah. Right. Because uh, I'm not going to be responsible for what you do. Yeah. I will help you train. I will help you to work to, towards your goal and so on and so forth. But I can't get you there. You have to do the work. Yeah. yeah. And that's not just in the boxing. Ring, that's in life too. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So. No, that's okay. That that's that's that, that. I say the same thing. I mean, I work with a lot of guys through uh, a, a program called uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. Okay. Yeah. Twelve steps. Yes. And. Uh, I tell them all, you know, I can, I can love you until you love yourself, Mm. right? That's, Mm -hmm. that's completely fine. But one thing I cannot teach you is the insidious insanity of alcoholism or drug use. I cannot teach you that you fucking earn that. Mm. And you Mm. earned it by standing in the grave before you decided to come and take step one, saying that your life was unmanageable. And then I can even teach you what God looks like because mm. it's on your own perception. Right. That's yeah. what it boils down That's to. True. I mean, Very I mean, true. it has nothing to do with what the Catholic church prescribes you or some Protestant minister or some Buddhist. It doesn't, that doesn't matter. What matters is God is needs to be personal to you. Very true. So anything out of that, um, anything to do with the steps after step one, mm-hmm. I'm down. I can carry them for the most part. Right. Yeah. But if they decide not to do what's actually prescribed within action, there's fuck all I can do. Yeah, like very true, very true, very like true. You can go to the gym every day of your life and be taught a combo. But if you go home and you don't do your push-ups and your setups and you don't do your own cardio, hit some road work in the morning and shit, <laughs> you're fucked, man. That's like <laughs> that's very true. And and it's very the truth. True. I mean, yeah. it's and they're comparable with life and gym life. You know what I mean? Right. Are you starting to see less kids today than you did before? Um, yes and no. It, 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 really, it, it really varies. Like right now, we're seeing a lot of younger kids now. Like before, they would start boxing at 12. Now, 6, 7, 8. I have probably two 7-year-olds, three 8-year-olds, 10, 12, uh, and then up. Um, whereas you, you didn't see that before, uh, most of the time, 
the kids are coming. The parents are bringing them in now because of, of the, the, uh, the bullying that's oh, yeah. going on in school and stuff like that. They want at least want them to be able to protect themselves if, if they're ever in that situation. Some of them have been in that situation. So mm-hmm. we sit down, we talk about that um, and how we can use this to control that sort of thing. Um, some just because they, all they do is play video games all day yeah, or, yeah. or they just sit around and do nothing. Well, no, you're going to do something. And it, it, it's still a cheap sport. Uh, yeah. We only, we, for our kids, we still only charge a hundred dollars a month. Wow. Right. So for two nights a week for an hour and a half, if they're under, uh, under 12, right. Sort of thing. Wow. That's a great price. So, um, they get a charitable receipt with that as well. We can give receipts. Uh, right now, we're not a charitable organization. We are a nonprofit, but oh, we're okay. not a charitable organization. Uh, we have, right now, we have no funding. That's why we're struggling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We're working towards uh, the funding, and we we do have some events coming up in the fall that we're going. So what we'll do, uh, what we'll do here is anybody who goes to our Patreon page, Life on Life's Terms, for the next thirty days, any money that goes in there, um, whether it be T-shirt money or the five dollars a week, we can't contribute it contribute it to uh south side legion but um there is i mean i have listeners uh, so if they decide to spread the word um like i said for the next 30 days that's that's what we'll do uh but aside from that well first so, off oh yeah come out have a free workout on us uh, if you're going to give somebody at least come down have a workout us and check us out. That yeah. would be awesome. And thank yeah, you very yeah. much for yeah. that. No, like, my pleasure. My yeah, pleasure. Right. Um, so one of the things that we did that I had heard just a little while ago, this is why I brought up this kids thing. The U.S. Marines cannot find 18-year-old men who meet the physical qualifications <laughs> to go in to the Marines because of they believe video games. Hmm. And right now in America, Navy SEALs, has not been able to bring in any recruits in the wow. last four years wow. because they do not meet physical requirements. Wow. I, you know what? I, I don't believe that's only to do with video games. Their, their choices of food yeah. would probably be number one. Um, yeah, I, I can't see it being just video games. So, so do you guys do that as well in the gym? Do you bring in diets talk about how to eat well not at the beginning um we once you start to get closer to competition then we start to discuss or or if you come in and you're you are uh, overweight then -hmm. we'll discuss okay you know eating habits what you're eating when you're eating how much you're eating and then what do you want to do are you looking to lose weight you want to learn to box you want to compete right so there's there's a lot of questions um we try to help them to, to answer. Once that's done, like once you get closer to competition, because you do have to watch your weight, we're not a club that makes you um, to sweat off 10, 15 pounds before the fight or something like that. We really try to control that, and that's where, you know, week or two weeks out starting to talk to you, okay, for the next such and such time, this is what you're going to be doing. Um, yeah. You, you, you're going to eat this time, you're going to drink this, you're going to stop eating at this time. <laughs> and the work, the work that you put in really helps you to either drop the weight or control your weight because mm-hmm. the work doesn't stop. It's continuous day after day. Yeah, and I, I can totally, I can empathize with that. And the reason why I can empathize, like, so, so this is, so when I was fighting, I would have to cut weight, Right. And so in the morning time, this is what our morning looked like. It was a 10 mile run really? off the bat and yes. we would go through uh, snow waist deep, <laughs> right? Nice. Push, push it through, push it through the yeah. field, yes. right? Then we would come back and we would do uh, uh, the cycle. Right. So the wind cycle and then like a, like a bike, okay. right? Okay. Yeah. And then from there, then we would jump into the pool and do hmm. aqua aerobics. If you weren't fucking puking, <laughs> and we would do it in the deep end, right? So yes. you had to tread water, As and that aqua aerobic. So the coach would be up on dry deck, yes, saying, "Pick up your, pick up your your knees to your chest while you're fucking treading water <laughs> in the deep end." And as soon as you feel your knees coming up. You could just feel the vomit coming Ooh. up. And you're like, oh, oh fuck, man. oh fuck. Yeah. <laughs> so then after that, he would say, then he would say, okay, jump in the sauna. 
Hmm. So then you go in the sauna for like five, eight minutes or whatever, get ready, and then you would go to work. So then after work, you would go back to the gym in the afternoon. Most of us only had part-time jobs. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, if you could call them jobs. So anyways, we'd go back to the gym, and then what? What? what it, we would then start sparring. But it was full out, hmm. full out sparring. And then you felt shaken. And because of that structure of up and down, I still have weight problems because of it. Mm. Because I was always dropping. I, I was only ever working to drop my weight right, yeah, through yes. water, dropping water or whatever I could. Right, yes. But I never learned the actual diet, di- like what is diet. Uh, like I was saying just before the podca- podcast started, before you came on, I uh, came in, was uh, I had to, I was eating carbs over the last two weeks more mm. than I typically do. The inflammation in my back is unfucking real right now. Mm. And that was just quick change. You know, okay, I'll, I'll eat because I work out. I do work out because I'm trying to drop my weight. Um, but I decided that I was going to eat bread and, you know, the, the shitty stuff, you yes. know. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the consequence of it, I'm feeling it. I mean, I tried to work out this morning. I got through my workout, yeah. but it was painful. It wasn't, and I'm still, my back is still feeling it. So it was like, first thing I did today is like, we're getting some fucking salad. <laughs> we're we're going to have some, some white, some white fucking meat tonight, you know? And I do do intermittent fasting. Okay. Um, and that, that seems to have helped quite a bit, but yeah. I still am on this huge journey or this uh, educational piece of what a diet will right, balance right. me out. I wish fighting would have given that to yeah. me. Because yeah. it's a huge benefit just for life. Yes, yes. See, yeah, and the, the one thing at our gym, like, we're we're not huge on dropping, like, tons of weight in order to make a lower weight class. It really depends on where you sit in between that class, mm. right? If you're five pounds over class weight, okay, we can work with that within a week, mm-hmm. right? But if you're 10 or 15 and you're killing yourself to get there, we, we don't we don't push you to that. We say, okay, let's look at the weight class you're in. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but we, we do have some guys that they take it upon themselves. Their weight is their problem. They, they'll get it off. And I've shaken my head. Sometimes I really have because it it is dangerous. It's not something you can, you can really mess with. And especially with, with young kids, we don't do it at all. Yeah. Yeah. You're whatever weight you're at. That's the weight you fight. Like even right now I'm using a sauna suit. Yeah. Uh, but the reason what I'm using my sauna suit for is like, um, uh, so I do a target ball. And yeah. the reason why I'm using it on the target ball is it keeps me warm. Mm. So that when then I go to my double ended, uh, double ended bag, I'm okay. Like I'm, I'm still there mm-hmm. and I like that warm up, but mm. I'm not sweating so much where when I take the sauna suit off, it's just like all this water coming off of me because right. I've been there too. Mm-hmm. I've been wearing clothes and sauna suit on in the sauna yeah. on the dyno yeah. fucking going and going and yeah, going that's... and you can taste the salt in your mouth and you have stopped sweating long ago yes, yeah. right no, that, that's yeah that's that's it's dangerous for for sure it's you don't want that i've yeah. seen i've seen some pretty scary things mm-hmm. like like i even know now if i start feeling uh, muscle spasms in my feet mm-hmm yeah, we need two, three more <laughs> liters of water. Like fighting has given me that. Yes, yeah. Uh, I'm intuitive to that now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I can shit the bed like the best of them, mm. find out that I, <laughs> I really need water and I'm going to the hospital for IV, right? And oh. a lot of that is because, and I've said this to my listeners, I started off at 365 pounds. Oh, wow. And I just made, I hit 290 this, this week, right? Oh. Over, over 60 days. Right. Wow, wow. And a lot of that was due to um, changing diet. So I try to keep carbs out as much as I possibly yes, can. Yeah. I have I have seen a huge, obviously a huge, significant um, uh, positive benefit to that. Right. Um, I try to stay. I remember in, when I was fighting, it used to be white is right. Green is go. So any any meat that was white, you could eat anything that was green. You got tons of. Right. Um, and stayed away from rice. Mm, the yes. only time that you could eat rice is if you had kimchi because the kimchi would 
push it through with our probiotics pretty quickly, or it had to be so spicy that you probably didn't like it in the first place. <laughs> we used to have this one guy on my team. He put, uh, he put four tablespoons of fucking, uh, wasabi. Oh, wow. In that shit so that he could actually eat rice. Oh, uh, wow. <laughs> it's, like, it's fucking brutal, man. <laughs> and the shit that we do, right? Right, like, right? We kill ourselves to get to that fight. We were prime. And that's what's kind of pissing me off in the, in the professional world right now of, of fighting is they're not giving guys rebound time. Yes. They're coming in. They're draining themselves. Out, they're basically rinsing. Right. And then they're fighting in like six to eight hours yeah. yes do you want to talk about concussion city yeah exactly exactly and that's that's one of the reasons why in, like in the amateurs uh, you weigh-ins are the day of and you fight within within five hours and that's why we stay away from the whole thing about you know dropping uh tons of weight trying to make weight that yeah that because like you say your your brain's made up of water mm-hmm. and if that's what you're sweating out you are not protected when you actually get in that ring and that, that, that I, I can't have that on my hands. Yeah. I, I just, yeah. I mean, that. that's what freaked me out too. And I was watching that thing about uh, concussions and they had said something about not being able to see what the other guy is doing. And I thought that I thought to myself, like if I'm in a fight and I can see his timing, I can see when he's breathing, I can see his hands, I can see his stomach pop out. But I'm not thinking anymore. I'm just fucking firing. Throwing, yeah. My God, like the the fear yeah. that would grip me. I like I would literally shit my pants. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yes. I've had I've had some some pretty intense situations in my life. But in the ring, they they equate to those as well, and it's scary as hell. Like I said, when you're standing there, you can see, and I can I can only imagine that you see his stomach come out. You're open. You can hit it, and you know it's gonna it's gonna have a lot of impact. Right. Yeah. But you can't throw it you because all you're it. thinking of is a fucking headshot. I got to knock this guy out. Fuck the points. This is what I'm going for. You can even see the liver, <laughs> and yeah. you're like, fuck yeah. this. <laughs> you know. I mean, that scares the shit out of me. Hmm. And and I've seen it because of a couple of my hits. I've seen it even in my life today. Mm-hmm. Like there's things that are happening. I'm watching traffic, and I'm like, what the fuck's really going on here? And I haven't been hit many times in the head, but obviously enough to where I look at that shit and I'm like, what the fuck's going on? And it takes me a couple seconds to really comprehend what's happening in front of me. And then I'm like, oh shit, it's a red light. I better stop. Right? Like, like that's what's kind of happening. Hmm. I don't know if you have any other friends in the boxing world that are experiencing that. But, but the, the, they're saying that stem cell therapy can help that significantly Hmm. where people and cognitive behavioral things that you can do. But like, there's a, I mean, this is the scary thing too, is there's a serious correlation between Parkinson's and boxing. That's, that's what they say. Yeah. Uh, Well, they've said that for a a lot of years and um, they're definitely, definitely to me, if you're taking a lot of headshots, there's got to be some damage. There's just no doubt about it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I have I know some old old boxers, and you can really tell because you knew them young, and mm-hmm. now that they're getting older and so on and so forth, you, you can really see the, the, diff- the changes. Mm-hmm. Um, boxing has got involved with Parkinson's patients, and that's actually a workout now for them. Wow! And it's been helping them to to regain some of their some of their mobility and and their their ability to actually um, live a normal life. So, which is cool. I, I think that it's really neat. But like going back to taking significant amount of punches, um, that's one of the areas where, for myself personally, I did not like. And that's yeah. why I uh, train to be defense, move, yeah, yeah. block, slip, right, hit and not get hit. Um, and I think that's what's what's made me excel in boxing at that time in that era because I was in the the era where you would just stand in the middle of the ring and and and, and pound the yeah. guy or the guy would pound you yeah yeah with no movement right so. it was almost and I, I found more on the canadian side it was almost like a fucking hockey fight yes sometimes yes. right it wasn't <laughs> boxing like what you saw in the states yes. it was like two two guys in the middle of the, the ring just 
just fucking one after another back and forth and they they might as well be holding the other guy's Eesh. shoulder right like yeah yeah it was it was knock them down rock them sock them kind of don cherry yeah. bullshit right yeah. like well, it was, it was we crazy. still have a few few boxers like that around <laughs> yeah. we even got one in our club i mean he's a great guy but you know he's uh, he's but he's been working to change so, and and the change is coming we really see it now so it's pretty cool do you find that uh so I have always said this, if you've been taught the wrong way in the beginning to change that later on, because it's almost like the, the thinking pathology is already there. Right. It's yes. very difficult to break that, that change. Have you noticed that as a coach? It, it, it is difficult, but it, it's not impossible. Mm-hmm. Um, it takes understanding. Uh, when, when we coach, uh, we try to explain Mm-hmm. Why, if if somebody's doing something wrong, we try to explain to them uh, the proper way to do it, or, or uh, another way to do it. We don't say no, you're doing it all wrong, but we, you know, we really try to give them an alternative, explain why mm-hmm. they'd want to change it, uh, and then help them to to continue to work on it until they they do make a change. But and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, we have we have people that well we actually have quite a few people that have come to our club from other clubs now these other clubs say we say we're stealing their boxes but it's not true (laughs) not true when they walk through the door on their own two feet and decide to change clubs um but we we do we make sure when that happens we do we call call their coaches and we talk to them and so on and so forth um i just have to put that disclaimer in there yeah yeah Yeah, well (laughs) but back that um because every coach is different, there's as many ways to do things as there are people, right? So a, a different uh, coaching style from the north side, you bring it to the south side, it, it, we're like, okay, well, that's good, but what if we did this? We add, try to add to it, right? And then correct it that way also, right? I used to see that, um, like you would see the French way. Mm-hmm. It, from from what I like, from where I'm from, so you'd f- see the French way, and then some wop, some Italian would come in, and he would show his way, right? And you would see, I don't know if you could say it's Latin, but you would see, you would see this, uh, you would see a variation of the same thing, but then if you jumped into an Irish, because where I'm from is very segregated, okay. okay, so you jump into an Irish club over in the west side completely fucking different you know what i mean totally totally different style their their even their elbows were in the same place but they weren't exactly where we like where we would have them and uh us french kids coming out of like the fucking ghetto we Mm -hmm. just want to fight everybody and we didn't think that there was a irish ghetto (laughs) apparently there was right (laughs) and uh that's where we got i mean that we always used to travel around and we would co- go back almost like spies to our own gym saying, fucking this guy, you really got to watch this guy. But we would never let our like semi-pro guys or the guys that were going to break pro. Right, right. We wouldn't let them. They would never go to other gyms. Mm. And so this is what we used to do. We were like the traveling gypsies. And then other clubs got the same idea. And so we en- it actually made the boxing culture much better because mm. then we all started just rounding. And so they basically say, you know, you got an alliance of the club saying, because we were ghetto, so we were subsidized, right? right? So our subsidy, if you had a subsidy card, you could go into any boxing club that Hmm. was part of that throughout the city. It didn't matter. So you didn't have to keep on paying the pot. Right, right. Because what all these boxing clubs were doing was they were coming together for their charitable stuff like casinos or whatever they were doing, all their drives. And then they would just divvy it up by percentages for everybody. Okay. And it worked out really well and it allowed, it stopped that gang mentality Hmm. between everybody because that was pretty shitty in my city. Like that was, (laughs) I mean, fuck, you didn't want to get caught in the West End, you know, like that was just not if you spoke French, you know, like it was, it was pretty, pretty strange that way. And boxing was a pass for that for us. Right. So it was, if you were a guy coming in a fight, then that was cool. Right. Um, Hmm. but imagine that this is a this is an hour now and so what we'll do is we'll wrap it up here and um i'm going to do some plugs real quick so uh 
any uh, anybody who's listening, you can catch us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitches, and what's the other one? Oh, Spotify. Yeah, <laughs> and you can check out uh, Justin Roberts' Life on Life's Terms um, on YouTube. You can check us check us out at Patreon. And like I said, for the next thirty days, any donations, any 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 subscriptions that come in, what we will do is we'll give them over to Southside Legion. You can also where can they check you out? Uh, Eighty seven thirty nine Fifty Third Avenue, okay, Edmonton, Alberta. Uh, and an uh, email address, anything like uh, that, or uh, yeah, sorry, it, a website. Uh, What's my website? Yeah, it's under it's under um, construction, but info at legionboxing dot com. Okay. Definitely. So uh, I would direct you guys to go and take a look at that. The uh, We're going to just claim Southside Legion as our uh, charity for the next 30 days. Thank you. And, Much uh, appreciated. And we'll see what we can do. Hopefully we can we can drive some money that way. Um, like I said, uh, so yeah, have a good evening and we'll talk to you soon. Bye for now.